And this next quote that I have here is one that I think is going to be sort of the basis for my talk. And it says that computers and then network computers and then ubiquitous network computers provide the mental scaffolding for us to deal with complexity. The complexity in today's world, the complexity in today's knowledge, and the complexity of education. I want to tell you sort of what I perceive as being some of the differences between data and information and knowledge, because I'm going to be using this sort of concept throughout, you know, throughout my talk. Um, data is objective facts without any judgment or context. It's just information. Data becomes information when in some ways it's categorized, analyzed, etc., and placed in context. Information is data that is endowed with relevance and purpose, and then information becomes knowledge when it is used to make comparisons, assess consequences, establish connections, and engage in dialogue. So what we have now, I believe, is a web that is full of data. Our goal instead has to be able to take that data and convert it into knowledge. So what is the status in terms of data on the internet? Once again, my opinions are the fact that there's been a lot of talk about the information revolution. The information revolution is over. And we won. The web, quite frankly, does not need any more data. It's got all the data it needs. What the really need to do is be able to figure out what to do with that data. The web is the world's largest data information base. And quite frankly, right now, it's beyond our reach. What we need to do instead are think about ways that we can take all that data on the web and from it create knowledge and create learning spaces. Now, I come back to this idea about scaffolding. That's one reason I like this metaphor. Um, one of the things that I loved about Hong Kong when I first came here was all the bamboo. <laughs> wow. I didn't know it was that great an idea. <laughs> uh, you know, it was all the bamboo scaffolding on these buildings and the people that run all over this bamboo scaffolding. And so that's why I like this idea of the web and the internet providing this scaffolding that we can build upon. I think that there's a number of web-related and internet-related technologies that have the potential to provide this kind of knowledge-building scaffolding for future learning spaces. And here's a couple of them that I want to introduce quickly to you. Some of you may be familiar with them. I know that some of them have been addressed in papers that have been presented at this conference. But this is just a collection, as it were. And in many of these cases, we're not just talking about technologies. We're talking about concepts. We're talking about new ways of thinking. Technologies are going to come and go. They're going to be new technologies this year, next year and this year. But the concepts by which we attempt to apply these technologies will hopefully remain the same. Now, the ones that I've identified are some of the big ideas of Web 2.0. I also want to mention some things about mashups. I had that, the um, workshop yesterday talking about mashups. Um, I want to talk about what's the future of search and what is called cloud computing, offline web applications, virtual worlds, and rich interfaces. So I want to quickly talk about these kinds of technologies and how they might potentially affect learning environments in the future. The first of these that I want to mention are sort of the big ideas of Web 2.0. First off, this idea is an emphasis on information, an emphasis on fresh information an emphasis on information that is delivered in the units in which people can best use it. The ability for other people to contribute, modify, enhance that information. That's one of the big ideas. 
um, applications that can be easily adapted, adapted for their particular use in a lot of different circumstances and environments. Um, applications that can take advantage of the so-called collective experience. No one person in a topic knows as much as a larger group of people in that topic. The web is a platform moving away from just our concept of the web as being nothing but a web browser and a server. Thinking about the web as being an entry point where we can do a lot of other interesting things. Um, focus on participation, not just publishing. So it's not just the person who creates the website who has control over the information. It's also the people who use that website and their ability to interact with that information. And as a result, this leads to a group concept where people have vested interests and mutual trust in the validity of the content and the data that they're adding to this environment. These are some of the big ideas that are in, you know, indigenous to Web 2.0. One of the important things, too, is this idea of ubiquitous web access, ubiquitous data access. Certainly, when we, at the beginning days of the web, it was always your desktop machine or your laptop machine. Now, of course, we know that there's web, there can be web access anywhere due to connectivity advancements, due to device proliferation, due to the incorporation of very strict standards, which means then that a lot of different devices can easily talk to one another. It's also some environmental factors, like people's desire to keep in touch with one another. These are a lot of things that have led to this idea of ubiquitous data access. So what we have now with the proliferation of these devices, like in the case when I talk about the ubiquitous web, is this idea that a mobile phone or mobile devices can actually also become learning space enablers. Why don't we take advantage of these devices in our learning process? And part of this is the idea too, I mentioned in yesterday's workshop about micro content. This idea now that if we're moving away from the web as being something that's delivered to us in pages, and you know, there's always been this ongoing debate in the case of web design is how big should a web page be? Nobody has a good answer for that question typically. Um, there's a lot of different theories about how big a web page could be, but the idea still is that a web page is some conglomerate of information where really the important thing are the pieces of information that people might be able to use when they access the web. So let's think about this content that we can get off the web, not in units of pages, but in units of meaningful content. We're thinking in terms about sharing. Um, here's an interesting physics page that I often use called interactions.org. Now the reason I have this as an example, sort of in this, is if you look at this page, you will see that the items on this page for sharing the information on that page are just as numerous as the menu items on that page. So the concept in this particular page is, you know, the information it contains is important, but your ability to share that information, comment on that information, send that information to your colleagues, send that information to your students, is also one of the key important functions of the web, not you, just you being able to surf through that website. I think that shows, once again, this idea of what the web has the potential for doing for spreading education and knowledge. So the whole concept certainly behind these social networks is the idea that people have some sort of common interest some sort of interest in topic. It also says, let's provide tools that encourages that communication. And let's encourage and provide tools where people can involve other people in the collection of that information. 